thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I really love that you keep it running, even though Corona is officially over. So um, let me start by uh, saying what we will talk about kind of in very broad terms. So what I want to consider is on a hyper... Oops, sorry, I first need to activate this here. Okay, on a hyperbolic surface, um, I want to consider automorphic functions. And these are here really understood at the moment kind of as unfolded objects. So they live on the upper half plane with values in C. They are invariant um, by, the, by the group action. So this G is somewhere in the gamma and the Z is in the H. And they should be eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, the standard Laplacian here. I will always split as usually the eigenvalue into S times one minus S. So we talk about spectral parameters. So these hyperbolic surfaces, they don't have any properties besides being geometrically finite. So I do allow elliptic elements. I also allow infinite area surfaces as well. What I want to understand is how I can study automorphic functions via genomics. Or if we go back a bit in history, why are the geometry of the space? And of course, we all know there are a lot of results. It's it's real history, which goes back uh, more than 100 years. So let me just mention two results, which will be also of interest for today. The one is um, the Zabik zeta function, which um, as we thing I, we all know is given by this infinite product, this double infinite product, the one going over an auxiliary parameter here, then having the Euler product in here. And this L which comes here in the exponent is um, the, it runs through the set of primitive length of periodic geodesics. And of course, it also goes via multiplicity. So if there are several uh, periodic geodesics with the same primitive length, we just have this in here several times. So what does the Zabik zeta function, which is a purely geometric object, helps us to understand automorphic functions. So this is a result which uh, in the first instance goes back to Zabik himself and then later on was generalized to other surfaces, refined and so on. So I would just omit um, references for this. It's just too many references. So it says we have a zero of the Zabik zeta function if and only if this S is a resonance um, of the Laplacian on the surface. So a resonance here is um, a pole of the resolvent. And for this purpose here, I do need the splitting into spectral parameters because otherwise I do have problems with meromorphic continuation of the resolvent or these um, zeros might come about for a different reason, which is called then a topological zero. So it's there by reasons which are not of spectral nature. We do understand very well where these topological zeros are, how many they are. It's really of minor order. So for the purpose of this talk, I will forget about these topological zeros. Um, also this, if and only if it's not 100% correct, there is a minor set of exceptions, but for the purpose of the talk, it's okay to just pretend it's an if and only if. So what do we see here? On the one side, we see a formula up here, which is formed only using a geometric information, or if you want dynamical information, namely the length of periodic geodesics, putting it into some object, which is then by its <clears throat> very nature of, of definition, a purely geometric object. This here has a, um, an axis of convergence, which is, um, I would say, easily proven. And then it has a meromorphic continuation. And in the meromorphic continuation, we might have zeros. And these zeros, give us spectral information of our surface. So the question what one can have here is, is it possible to go deeper 
into this kind of relation that we can say, we do not only see resonances, we do not only see the, the spectral parameters, not only the poles, not only the eigenvalues, we see more. We also see the eigenfunctions, the automorphic functions belonging to these eigenvalues to the spectral parameters as well. And indeed, this is possible by now, at least for some surfaces, and it's getting more and more um, extended, these kind of results. So let me recall this or show you this in a um, first example. So um, this here, which I'm stating now, actually goes back already by now 20 years probably, um, where it's possible to assign to automorphic functions something which is called a period function. We will see an example in a second. Or um, actually functional equations, which are defining equations for period functions. So how does this here go? In as kind of first the abstract way what we want to expect here. So on the one side, you take an automorphic function and you assign to it another function, which is typically living on some real interval. And the, um, the way to go from the one side to the other is that it's typically given by the integral of a certain closed form I will give you a precise example in a moment. This form um, takes as input um, the, the automorphic function itself, and of course this parameter t, and then it integrates along a well-chosen geodesic, which makes it reasonable to call it a period function. So what we will be mostly interested in is not the period function itself, but more the function equation they satisfy. So for example, the first example where this here was worked out in precise terms is for our favorite modular group. So this uh, function on the, um, the period function is satisfying this functional, this, uh, functional equation here. And this T here is just running through the positive reals. Okay, so what is more interesting than even the functional equation itself is how it comes about or how one can say it comes about. Originally, this bijection up here was proven by Louis Zagier in number theoretic terms. So they used harmonic analysis, a lot of analytic number theory. But after that, there was developing a different approach to that, which goes via dynamics and which from my perspective gives a bit more more insight about why it's working, what we should expect for other uh, focusing groups, and so on. So the participating entities which we have here are actually like this. The, the functional equation, it looks at the moment when you look at this functional equation, you would say it, it's kind of arbitrary. Of course, you see something here. Um, when you think about the uh, modular group as being generated by this element here, and then, of course, also by this element here, you do see the action of these elements in here. It would be kind of an action of this element. And here you do see the action of this element. And this here is something which is very built in into the system and which comes from a dynamical approach to this. And we'll try to tell you what is the dynamical approach here. So what we have is how we go to these functional equations is this. You take your surface. This here is for the example of the modular surface. On the surface, you have the geodesic flow. So let's say here's a geodesic. It's moving on your surface. And you try to encode your geodesic in a way that you can handle it in a much better way than just having kind of this continuous flow on your, on your surfaces. So what you do is um, you pick a so-called cross-section. A cross-section is a set in the unit tangent bundle, um, which is intersected by every periodic geodesic. And whenever you have an intersection, it is discrete in space and time. So it's sufficient to think about discrete in time when you travel along the geodesic. 
in this setup here, I would take a, a cross section, which is based on a complete geodesic. And the way you should really think about this is, is you go to the upper half plane. So you unfold the situation. You um, move this year over to here. Yeah, it's all these unit tangent vectors on the imaginary axis, which point to the right. Let me draw in the classical fundamental domain. This would be here. Somewhere there is I. Somewhere here is minus one half, more, more or less. And um, what I did instead of unfolding it completely, I took over the part which is originally here. I brought it back down here, which is possible by the action on the surface. So the second thing I want to do is I want to change now. Uh, let me restart the explanation here. What I want to do is this. I take a geodesic, so a starting point here. Let's say it is this. I move along this geodesic. A cross section is chosen in a way that it intersects again. Otherwise, um, it's a non-well chosen thing. And um, also this second ping vector will be somewhere, let's say it's here. I follow this geodesic here. This is the first one. So let's give them some, some recognizable things. So this is the V, this is the W thing. And I do the same with the second geodesic. And I ask myself, how do I move from this point here, the endpoint of that geodesic, to this point here? It needs to be possible within the group action because on the surface, so on the quotient, it's the same geodesic, just time shifted. Okay? Good. So how do I do this? Um, the way to do it is you take the green thing here. And you move it across the whole space with a group action. So you consider this set here. And when you play around with the fundamental domain and all this um, side pairing properties, what you notice is it's better to think about this fundamental domain here, this here, tuck, tuck, and move that around. You will end up with something like this, this triangle. And then the only places where you have to look for um, next intersections is either here or it's here because all the other vectors, um, all the other tangent vectors are not in your um, transported set. So in this situation, which we are in here, the vector of interest, the next intersection would be this. Um, let's call this, I don't know, G, V. And you also know which element G half. This here is just um, this group element acting on the full set of um, cross-section here. So the you move these GV, the GW, of course, back to the W by applying G inverse. So this element, let's call this T, the T inverse. So which also means down here, you have to apply the T inverse to go from the X to the X prime. Okay, so and this is something you just do for all tangent vectors, so for all geodesics, uh, which are there in your cross section. And then you look very um, closely at the boundary down here. And you notice as soon as your endpoint of the geodesic is above one, you will always use the element T inverse. And when it's below one, it's somewhere between zero and one, you will use this element here. Okay, and then it gives you on the boundary, so on R plus, it gives you a map, let's call this capital F, which goes like this. So when you're above one, you're mapping here with the T inverse. And when you're in here, you're also mapping um, to this set here. And here you apply, let's let's call this otherwise, uh, this other element is T transpose and then the inverse, so it looks like this. 
Okay, so. No. Okay. So what do we do with this for getting the functional equation? Now there's coming an idea from statistical mechanics or ergodic theory, thermodynamic formalism. What we want to have is an operator, which is an evolution operator of this map F. So the way to think about this is this. You have a little function F, which is living on the domain of the capital F. So on zero infinity, pretend it to be a density or a distribution function. So something you want to evolve with time and time means one time step for the capital F. So what you do is you take one point and you ask for all the pre-images you have and you accumulate all the information at these pre-images and in, in front of here, you have to take, because of um, the Kubi determinants, the uh, derivative of the capital F to the minus one. And um, because of statistical mechanics, you want to have something which is kind of an inverse temperature, which is then getting into the spectral parameters instead of the one, you take the S in here. And then you just evaluate it. So you see for every point which you can have, you have two pre-images. And if you go through the full calculation, you will find that you get exactly the functional equation from above on the nose. Okay? Okay, so what is going on here? So what is the way of thinking about this? Um, this encoding of geodesics you can understand is discretizing the geodesic flow so that you have kind of a discrete dynamical system, uh, which is reflecting certain information of the geodesic flow and exactly that information which we want to use. These unfolding procedure with inducing an, an, a map on the boundary is kind of a, again, a discrete system. Here, of course, you're losing some information about what happens in backwards time, but forward time is sufficient in particular if you only want officially or honestly talk about periodic geodesics because a forward direction of a periodic geodesic knows what's happening in the backwards direction. And then you're trying to find kind of an e equilibrium state. And this is done by this evolution operator that it asks you for how is how's life being for the function, so how it's distributing mass. And in the end, you will ask for one eigenfunctions here. And the this parameter S, which goes in here, is deeply motivated by physics, telling us, okay, somehow we need to have some additional property in here, kind of thinking back to correspondence principle between classical and quantum mechanics. So somehow spectral information needs to be built in here as a kind of inverse temperature, which is then for a mathematician, just a spectral parameter, which goes into this exponent. Okay. So the way you can think about this approach here compared to the Zabbik zeta function is this. When you think about the Zabbik zeta function, you find spectral information on your um, automorphic functions, but only the eigenvalues or the spectral parameters. What we have down here with this bijection, so this bijection here, is we get information on the automorphic functions themselves by using also the flow, the, the actual the dynamics, not only the length of periodic geodesics, we only use we also use the periodic geodesics themselves. This is an approach. Um, with this uh, transfer operator business, which is by now, I would say about 20 years old. It goes in a lot of names. So Louis Yagier from the beginning on, from the number theoretic side, and there's Dieter Meyer, who is a physicist, and there's his doctoral student, Shang. And then also I did some parts about this by simplifying this system here. Okay, the question one immediately has here is, of course, how is 
this here related to the Zabig zeta function. And there's another interesting object um, coming about here. So when you think about this dynamical system, which we have in here with this one step situation, it feels a bit like continued fractions, but way too slow, right? Because whenever you have something which is up here, let's say it's, it's a 10, 10x plus an epsilon, you would move 10 times backwards just with a one. You can speed up this thing here by saying, okay, um, instead of having the next hit, I want to count as one objects all the successive um, uses of the same kind of intermediate action, which will give you a second discrete dynamic system, which is then actually the continuous fraction algorithm, which also comes with an evolution operator. I would call this um, fast because it's speeded up. This here is then on a good space in nuclear operator, which means you can take a, a fretum determinant of that. And this is on the nose, the Zabig zeta function for the system. So which means you do get information back of the Zabig zeta function situation via this approach, but this approach um, it has kind of deeper information, even though at the current state of art, we cannot, we don't know how to use all the information which is built in into the system. So there's still a lot of research to be done to get information out of the system about uh, automatic functions or distribution of resonances or whatever you want to do. But what I want to focus on today is another question Namely, when you have your automorphic functions in this unfolded situation with which I started, you have the standard question, why you want to work with this and not with something more general. So what I would like to do is instead of going only into C, I would like to be in a vector valued situation so some finite dimension vector space here. And I also would like to have a representation here, um, at the moment, a unitary representation, which allows me to have an equivariance here, which is not trivial. <clears throat> um, why do I want to have this? So of course, there are a lot of advantages when um, sees when one works with this time by time. So also for me, it took quite some time uh, until I, I understood how, how powerful this can be. So the first thing is when you want to work with one group, you can go through the whole business, what you want to do. And then the question comes, what happens if I take a different group? <laughs> then officially you have to do the whole business again. But if it's a subgroup of finite index, then uh, you can build in the finite index, so the subgroup into this business by using the induced representation from the subgroup to the group you already worked with and just consider this vector valued setup. So you can study both of them simultaneously and Honestly, whenever you have these representations in, you study anyway a whole bunch of representations, so you have even more of these subgroups built in. Another reason why one wants to study it is this. Think about having not only one representation, but a continuous family of representations with, which starts at the identity. So, and you want to understand how something is behaving by using a perturbation. So you have some property, I don't know, maybe finding zeros, uh, finding poles, and then you modify the system and you ask how stable is being a zero under this perturbation. And one way to do these perturbations is by putting in representations into the system and then slowly moving along a family of um, representations. So this is something I would call perturbation. Then of course, there is also a historical um, reason Zellbeck himself promoted to do exactly that, to study vector valued automorphic functions simultaneously with the classical ones, 
to see what are the difference, what are the similarities, what are what stay stable under turning from classical to vector valued ones to understand their properties. And by now, um, they are also used somehow in physics. Don't ask me about the physics. I only know that physicists ask for these representations, so they will have a good reason to do this. When it comes to these questions above, with the Zabik zeta function, there is a Zabik zeta function also for unitary representations. Um, you just build in the representation into the formula. I will show you the formula in a minute. And this um, if and only if statement about the zeros stays true. It just carries over, at least for finite area hyperbolic surfaces. There is still a gap in the literature about infinite area hyperbolic surfaces. But from my perspective, this is more like just a gap that um, it's not that new methods are needed. Also, this second part with um, how to go from automorphic functions to period functions, if you follow through these old papers and also some, some newer papers, which I will come to, you see that you can build in unitary representations into this whole isomorphism, and it also stays true. It's it's not really written up, but um, because we worked with more general situations, but one sees that it, it carries through. Okay. And before I state the Zabek zeta function, let me ask a new question. Um, and the question is, why do we want to restrict to unitary representations. And when I started to ask myself this question, which is by now some years ago, I my honest answer was, I don't know, why should we? And then I looked around a bit and found that people started working on exactly this question. What happens if this representation is not unitary anymore? Um, how much is still valid. So wh why do people do this? There is a motivation coming from physics. Um, and again, here, I only know that there is motivation from physics. I do not really understand why and how it's needed. Somehow it's used, used for conformal field theory. There's also quite some literature about uh, vector valued automorphic functions with non-unitary representations by Knopp and Mason. They call it generalized automorphic forms, so they talk about forms. The whole motivation above here with uh, perturbation theory, this of course stays, and also when you want to talk about finite index uh, subgroups, of course this stays into the in the picture because it was there before. Um, the effect, what we see here, in addition, how much more flexible it is, is this. So let's say this is a complex plane. And um, let's suppose this is our hyperbolic surface. So for the experts in the audience, this is a hyperbolic, it's a Schottky surface with one generator. So I have one... Um, parabolic element, uh, sorry, one hyperbolic element, which is generating the full group. The um, set of resonances looks like this. It's on a grid. For the classical setup. So this is for um, the situation that you have no twist here. If you now have a twist in here, and you allow the twist to be unitary, then you're moving, and you start at the identity and then slowly move up and down. This is a one-dimensional situation at the moment, so it's a character. You would just move up and down in this direction. But when you allow this to be also a non-unitary um, family, then you can move wherever you want. So if 
if I tell you, okay, I want to have this point move to that, I can give you a family which would do this, and then some of the others have to adapt. If you tell me you want to have this here move to that, I would just give you a family of representations we go through non-unitarily, and um, I can move it in there. So kind of the perturbation which you're allowed to do are much more flexible. I'm sorry? Yep. Um, I don't understand what's the relation between the lattice picture on the left yep. and so the quotient of H mod the um, one parameter uh, yep. discrete yeah, yeah, subgroup. So um, I'm asking the question if I consider this surface here, this, um, this hyperbolic um, cylinder, what are the resonances on that surface? You can also say some, uh, as the same thing. What are the zeros of the Zabbix zeta function for this situation? And in this situation, the Zabbix zeta function is just this. Um, oh, sorry, this, this becomes unreadable. Um, Zabbix zeta function. Here, so it's here's a square, and then it's uh, minus uh, still this problem um, s plus k, and then it's the length of this geodesic, which is going around here. Okay, so I see. So, so the left is the zeros in the complex plane of the Selberg zeta function. Yes. And then you say when I transform by a of t, and uh, so an eigen. I've got an eigenform, an automorphic form u, and then I may change the spectral parameter and get you another zero. Is that what you're saying? Um, almost. <laughs> so um, the, the black dots are just the zeros of the Zabbix zeta function, and then I ask for a different function space. So then I ask for, um, in terms of function, it becomes then this Zabbix zeta function um, with the representation in here. And then you have this e to the minus l. And then honestly, you have a plus and minus here because it, the square resolves. And then I'm asking for the zeros of the second one. And I ask, how do the zeros of the original Zabbix zeta function, the black one, belong to this pink one? So how, how the zeros are moved along the space. Another way to say it is this. I'm asking for the Z for the um, spectral parameters of the Laplacian of the invariant functions. And I ask, okay, if I have an eigenvalue there or a spectral parameter there, and I now turn to the space of the equivariant functions, does this eigenvalue survive or is it moved somewhere? Okay? Please say yes or no. Yes, thank you. Good, thank you. And what we see is that when you, um, if you stay with unitary representations, you are quite restricted, at least in this example, and this is something we observe in general, but if you allow arbitrary or quite arbitrary non-unitary representations, you're much more flexible in moving around. And this might help you to understand properties which are there. Okay, so and then the question of course was, if we want to do um, a Zabbix zeta function for non-unitary representations or this um, bijection between automorphic functions, which are now equivariant and some type of functional equations, can we do this? Is it reasonable to expect that there are results? And we started, at this site where we said, first, the Zabbix zeta function needs to exist. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to kind of start with doing something. And uh, we understood after some time, what is the real problem when, what one has, has there? So um, the question is, as a question, which representations, which non-unitary representations can I allow? can I allow for having a Zabbix zeta function? 
And then as soon as this question is answered, we can ask, can I go on and see all the other properties which I would like to see in addition? Okay, so let me draw a picture um, which hopefully explains what's the problem. We expect a Zabbix zeta function of this form. So here's our representation. Here are these um, two products. Here's the determinant of kind of the Euler product. I I'm, will explain all the things in a second. Yeah. So we have the Euler product. This um, is here now the norm of an hyperbolic element. Instead of talking about uh, periodic geodesics, I convert them into equivalence classes of primitive hyperbolic elements because it's much easier for any purposes of doing something really here. And the unitary case showed us that the representation needs to go here to um, give us reasonable results. So we do expect that we have in the end the same formula, but only with a non-unitary representation. And the first question is, is this infinite product able to converge somewhere? And this is really the problem one has to think about. So this is your surface. This is a surface with a cusp. Here is somehow the rest of your surface. You only have to focus on one cusp to understand what the problem is. You think about, again, about these hyperbolic elements as being periodic geodesics. And because there is a cusp, we all know that there are these periodic geodesics which can go deep into the cusp, as deep as you would like to have them. Then at some point they turn around, they go back, and then they pass their life down here and they close up. And all these periodic geodesics will have an impact on your formula. If you understand these periodic geodesics in terms of the hyperbolic elements, then for the picture, it means this. You have one group element, which kind of transports you into the cusp area. Then you have a parabolic element, which is doing the rotation, the winding around the cusp area to with some multiplicity here. So this is the number of windings. And then you go back and then the geodesic does whatever it would like to do. So, and the M can be any number, all M's, so any positive number, all M's appear and they all need to be handled um, by this infinite product. So, which means when you, uh, it's better to have it this way, when you now have this um, H as one of the H in there, so it's actually an HM, in here, into your product, you have something which is more like something you can control. You have a parabolic element to some power. You have a representation of some element you do not really care about. But this, this part here, this appears in your formula for all M's. If you now just pretend it's a matrix, if you have a matrix with a large eigenvalue, this would give you an exponentially increasing thing in there, which shows if, if you have a matrix which is not really good behaving, so when eigenvalues are too big, you have a factor in which explodes. And then the infinite product cannot converge. So there's one solution around this, is um, you restrict the representation, the, the realm of representation with which you want to work, and you say, okay, you only want to allow those, geo, uh, those representations for which the windings don't cost us anything. So in terms of mathematics, it means whenever you have a parabolic element here, that um, the eigenvalues of um, the xenomorphism which you have here, they all need to have absolute value one because then it means it's not really increasing, it's also not decreasing. So it kind of is stable, it's just a bit rotating. Or in other words, 
um, the Jordan normal form of all of your parabolic representations look like this. There's some eigenvalue. You are allowed to have any kind of length of Jordan blocks. And all the eigenvalues here have to be absolute value one. So representation of this form has a name. It's not given to this by us. It's by Eskin, Konsevich, uh, Müller, and Zorich. It's called non-expanding cast monodromy. Um, abbreviated as NECM. So at the moment, we only have heuristics, which tells us we would like to have these type of representations in our business. And indeed, this is possible. It's a result which is by now some years old with Xenia Fedosova, Oops. where we could prove that um, for all geometrically finite gamma, so no restrictions, also infinite area is perfectly fine with this, is if the representation I use in the Zabbix zeta function has this non-expanding cosmonotropy property, then the Zabbix zeta function converges as soon as the real part is of S is sufficiently large. You can give precise bounds on what this means, but for our purposes, this is sufficient. And if you do not have this property, then you also have no convergence, nowhere which means this NECM domain of representations is exactly where you can expect a Zebic theory, which has a Zebic zeta function, which is given by an infinite product. If you want to work with Zebic zeta function, of course, the question is, do convergence is not sufficient. Do I have a meromorphic continuation? And there we took an approach, which is somewhat very unconventional. We said we want to go via the dynamics. We do not want to go via this classical theory, via, I don't know, microlocal analysis, harmonic analysis. We want to use that we have a very good feeling about that these transfer operators, this evolution operators can handle representations. We want to take advantage of that. And the answer here is if, if we have a transfer operator approach so let, let me say this in easier words. Um, if there exists a transfer operator such that the Zabbix zeta function, so it's for this gamma uh, and for the xi, uh, sorry, um, not for the xi, for the trivial representation. So if it exists such that the Fretum determinant is the Zabbix zeta function, the untwisted Zabbix zeta function on the nose, then you can put in this representation at all levels. So which means as soon as you managed to find a good coding for your geodesics, which gives you a nice kind of continued fraction algorithm for which you can have this equality here, which is sometimes very helpful, you get for free the built-in representation um, situation. Of course, then the question is, um, what about this if here? And this is some new work. This is with uh, my former PhD student, Paul Wapnitz, who finished last year. And so a paper came out this year. Um, what we can say is for many, there's still some technical problems, but for many non-uniform um, geometrically finite gamma, we have these operators. Um, this is a result which at the moment when you see it as a statement, looks like, okay, there is this an existence result, but actually the result itself is constructive. So if you give me your favorite gamma, I sit down maybe 10 minutes, maybe two days, and produce you this operator here. And there is work in progress with um, Charlotte Pfeiffer. So this is almost done. And then if there's nothing wrong anymore, then we would have an all here. 
Okay. Then the question is, if we think back about the classical theory, the Zabbix zeta function, the zeros are important in the meromorphic continuation. And here then the question is, do I have also here a spectral interpretation of the zeros of the Zabbix zeta function with these um, non-unitary representations? Of course, there are, as usual, two approaches to try this. The one is going via classical process via harmonic analysis and try to do it somehow there to mimic kind of the classical proofs. But the way we took is we wanted to understand, can we do it via having this um, transfer operator, which gives us the bijection wire period functions. And this is something which is still in progress, but is so much done that um, we are absolutely sure that there is no problem anymore. So this says this for certain, I will tell you in a minute what means certain, for certain hyperbolic surfaces um, of infinite area, So we wanted to have also with cusps. And then um, honestly, some restrictions on spectral parameter. We have a result of this type. We have automorphic functions um, uh, which are vector valued with your representation, which you consider plus some properties, which um, concern like how they decay at cusps and funnels. They are um, isomorphic with an explicit isomorphism to the eigenfunctions of these transfer operators, which you build in a similar way then for the SL2. R situation, uh, SA to Z situation. Also here you have some conditions on regularity of your functions, on how they decay at boundaries of interval. And in between you have a second object, which is kind of mediating between the two worlds. This is a cohomology. Um, So here, the um, the module on which you represent is essentially function spaces for the um, principal series representation, but you need to have some additional conditions to make things work. And also on the co cycles, you sometimes need to have some conditions. So it, it all comes about very natural, but it takes quite some time to state it. So let me say one word about the idea. Um, what we do here is this. Before, when you thought about the SL to Z situation, you were going from automorphic functions to period functions by integrating along well-chosen geodesics, which are somewhat related in a way which I didn't explain to the coding which you have. Well, here you cannot do that anymore. So in this situation, you need to um, go from certain points and let me say it basis for coding. But you still have the old um, uh, form, the old closed form, which allows you to do this. You put in your automorphic function, you get out a function on some parts of R, which you then see is a function uh, is an eigenfunction of the transfer operator which you developed via um, the coding. But in between, to prove all the things, you see what you honestly do is more something like this. Um, instead of going via the one uh, part where you did the, uh, where you put in your cross section, you exchange this into a second part. And um, how, how should I say it? The easiest way to say it is the transfer operators mimic kind of a simplicial cohomology which you use in this whole business to get things working. Okay, what we did 
what we did then is we asked ourselves what are good uh, spaces of automorphic functions which you can single out here um, for nice properties. Uh, we came up with three classes of functions. It's, it would take some time to write it down, but the classes which we have is one class which is quite arbitrary, which just says at a funnel. So these spaces with which we work here, they look typically like this. They have a cusp, they have a funnel. Where we want to say at the funnel, the decay, uh, the, the growth is not too bad. So it's somehow controlled. Then we have a, then we can go through all this here and really write down what are the properties we need at every level? What are the precise conditions? Then there is a second subclass, which tells you it shouldn't grow too fast at the cusp. So it's still not a cusp form, but it's kind of controlled. It has polynomial growth into a cusp. Also then at that level, you can, at every instance, you can write down explicitly what you have there. And of course, in the end, we have something which is honestly cusp form. So you have a decay at a cusp with a very fast rate. And also then you can um, characterize again at every level what is what you want to have. So with that, I would like to end here. Thanks a lot.